Coming up on DTNS, a check-in on the trends in fintech out of the Finnovate conference, why Facebook won't have to take down posts worldwide just because the EU says so, and your cable bill is much bigger than you think. This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, October 3rd, 2019. In Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Feline, I'm Sarah Lane. From Oakland, California, I'm Justin Robert Young. And uh, I'm Roger Chang, the show's producer. Very excited uh, to have Tony Staley, uh, product development at the Ohio Valley Bank with us uh, today. Tony was just at the Finnovate conference, and we're going to talk to him about some of the trends in fintech. Tony, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Glad to be here. We're also going to get your opinion on your cable bill as well in a little bit. <laughs> it's not good. <laughs> <laughs> it never is. Uh, we were just talking on the Good Day Internet show about hamburgers and funerals. Uh, so if either or both of those sound interesting, uh, you can get that show by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Apple analyst Ming-Chi Kuo has information indicating that Apple will launch the next version of the iPhone SE 2 in the first quarter of 2020. The phone will reportedly be more affordable and feature new internals like an A13 processor, 3 gigabytes of RAM. Kuo says the new iPhone SE's hardware specification will look much like the iPhone 8 and predicts that Apple will sell 30 to 40 million units across the year. The developers of the HK Map Live app tweeted that Apple has pulled the app from their app store. HK Map Live pulled uh, uh, pulled reports from Telegram where police were located and where tear gas was being used in Hong Kong. Apple told app creators that it quote facilitates, enables, and encourages an activity that is not legal unquote. The app remains available in the Google Play Store. It's unknown if Apple made this decision internally or if it received any pressure from the Chinese government. Intel and Brown University have begun work on a DARPA-backed project called Intelligent Spine Interface. Over the next couple of years, scientists will capture motor and sensory signals from the spinal cord, and electrodes will be placed at both ends of a spinal injury to create a bypass of the break. Neural networks will then try to learn how to pass the motor commands through the bypass to restore movement. The system will use external hardware with the intent of eventually developing an implanted system. Now, they don't know if this is gonna work or not, but even if the project is not successful, it is expected to discover new information about how spinal cords work, which could be immensely valuable. France plans to use facial recognition and registration for LSM, which is France's digital ID system that launches in November. The system requires users to take a selfie in an Android app, which is then compared to a passport photo. France says it won't match facial scans with citizens' identity databases. And according to the Interior Ministry, facial recognition data would be deleted after enrollment. Once enrolled, citizens can use the digital ID to secure access to things like taxes, banks, social security, and utility bills. France, uh, France's data regulator, CNIL, says that the system violates GDPR, though, and rules of consent and privacy groups have filed lawsuits with the French administrative court. All right, let's talk a little bit more about another EU activity that's got a little controversy. Austrian politician Eva glafschnig Pyshek got Facebook to remove comments harmful to her reputation, but she wanted Facebook to remove all copies of the comments as well. Facebook said she had to tell them where the copies were, and then they would remove them. So Eva took them to court. The European Court of Justice has now ruled that judges may order Facebook and other platforms to remove identical copies of posts as well as equivalent versions where the message is essentially unchanged without requiring separate notices for each one. The court also confirmed that the platform is not liable for the posts, so safe harbor still exists in the EU. But here's the sentence from the judge's decision that got everybody's attention, and I'll quote it. In addition, EU law does not preclude such an injunction from producing effects worldwide within the framework of the relevant international law. So every headline is now, EU court requires Facebook to take down posts worldwide. And there's all, a lot of uh, objections from Facebook saying, well, the EU shouldn't legislate outside its borders. I think that's a misinterpretation or a 
too wide interpretation of this because what this decision seems to be saying is if there's a treaty or if there's international law that the EU and other countries have agreed to, then any country who has agreed to that uh, and, and if it then applies, you would be able to take this down, but only if that country has already agreed to abide by the same law, if that makes sense. So we're still able to slander European politicians here in America. Uh, well, not under U.S. law. So you don't want to slander. Slander has a very specific legal definition, Justice. Well, but, indeed, indeed. Well, and of course, slander would have to be uh, in or libel audio, right? Because libel is written. But uh, uh, so yeah, so so you are saying that this is not quite the the or Orwellian shakedown that it is being portrayed as. So. No, I actually feel like this this decision is fairly reasonable. The judges said, look, Facebook's saying. You have to tell us where every instance of this is for us to take it down. And the judges say it's a lot easier once you know what the post is and once a court of law has determined it's illegal, it's a lot easier for you to find copies of it. So you need to do that. Uh, and I think that's reasonable. And the court also said, and by the way, if other countries' laws are in harmony with the EU here, uh, then yeah, Facebook, you you should probably take it down. Uh, that's kind of like an extradition treaty, right? Like if the laws are in harmony, then yeah, you're going to have to follow it in those other countries if the plaintiff wants to. Uh, what's not said is if the laws aren't in harmony, then no, you won't need to. And I think that will probably apply as well. I do. Well, think in a situation like Facebook, okay, uh, you've got your, your Twitter retweets. There are certain s tools in place that didn't used to exist that now make yeah. it easier to share things like this. But you can do it manually in a lot of different ways as well. So how does a platform deal with something like that? If someone actually is like, uh, you got a lot of copies of this slanderous content and they all got to come down. What what does a company like Facebook do in that situation? I mean, they run a control F, right, basically, <laughs> and just be like, take it all down. I, yeah. It feels, feels a lot easier for them to do that than to say, sorry, plaintiff, you have to find every single retweet. Uh, and if they're right. in private groups on Facebook, well, we, you know, we can't do anything about that. Uh, so I, I don't know. It's It's not it seems like it would not be difficult to to find copies of this in the database and remove them. Here's something that's easy to find, work. At least that's what Uber wants you to think now that they have launched Uber Work, an app to match shift workers with employers in multiple professions like cleaners, bar staff, and warehouse workers. The app will provide information on pay, location, and working conditions and let workers track working hours and breaks. Uber Works partners with staffing agencies providing the technological front end for matching while the agencies, quote, employ, pay, and handle worker benefits, end quote. The service is currently limited to Chicago at launch with plans to expand to other cities soon. Similar apps like Winolo, WorkPop, and ShiftGig do already exist in this space. Yeah, and people who work at those three apps are not happy, I'm sure, about Uber moving into their space, even if it is just in Chicago for now. Uh, this seems like a really smart idea for Uber to say, look, we have software that's really good at matching. Let's go into a, an existing industry that's already happening where we're not trying to disrupt things. We're just trying to make it easier for these companies to find their temp workers and the temp workers to find the company. And we're not trying to change laws or get around laws. That, that seems like a pretty safe and efficient way for Uber to go, no? It also seems like a good idea for Uber to not involve anybody driving a car. Aha. Uh -huh. That has obviously been tremendously uh, uh, discussed uh, with the new California legislation that uh, uh, will likely be signed by the governor. But also... The fact that Uber has an IPO or just IPO'd recently, their stock has fluctuated as the market has kind of taken a second look at some of these companies. And now they want to be big and loud, not only on the legal side, but also on the financial side to say, we're not just driving. We are a software company that has mm -hmm. a that had a big hit with matching drivers with riders. But that is not the only thing that we do. No matter how much you hear about the only way we'll be profitable is if we have self-driving cars. And that's obviously not going to happen within the next few years. You know, I, when when I first heard about this, I was like, what is it we're doing? I mean, wow, we're 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 we're, all, we're on all sorts of tangents right now. Winolo is a company I'm actually familiar with. Uh, I have a friend who um, for the last several years has just kind of done a variety of odd jobs. When I say odd jobs, sometimes they last more than a day. Sometimes, you know, it's like sort of a month or two or that sort of thing. But it is uh, skilled work that he specifically uh, was the right person for. 
and it actually uh, kept him employed, kept him busy. And I know that's not for everybody, but this this model uh, is not a bad model, uh, you know, for for the right kind of person. So it'll be interesting to see if if uh, if Uber does it better than the competition that already exists. And it's less risky for them to uh, to do something like that uh, because this is something where the agencies that provide the temps uh, are are taking on a lot of the risk of benefits and are they really contractors sure. and all of that. So uh, Uber's got to love that side of it too. Well, Moving on to Instagram now. Instagram launched an app called Threads, which pulls its contacts from your close friends list on Instagram. And then the app opens to the camera with shortcuts to make it fast to send people photos and videos, the close friends, that has drawings and text overlays, but no filters. But it also has a status feature that lets you set an emoji as an away message, for example, for your friends. You can also choose to make the status automatic based on your phone's location, accelerometer, and battery level. You just really want to overshare everything with your close friends again. Emojis include pre-made ones uh, like a thumbs up for free, um, a, a, a strikeout for busy, uh, you know, I'm studying, and you get the idea. You can create your own as well. Facebook says it won't store information that is location data driven and will also auto delete from your phone after a short period of time. Instagram doesn't plan to monetize threads at this point. So they say. So they say. <laughs> like, like right now, literally, if you're, hey, Instagram, are you monetizing threads? No. Yeah, not, no, we're not, not doing now, that right now. Not right no. now. Oh. This is just this is just a fun app to share literally everything about where like where in your house you are based on your accelerometer with your closest three friends. Well, and that's the idea is, look, these are cool things for people to be able to say, oh, if I could just have it automatically say, hey, I've got low battery. That's why I'm not responding. Or, uh, yeah. you know, my mom wants to know where I'm at. Tell her I'm at the grocery store. This can automatically do that. You wouldn't want this to do it in a place like Instagram where you might be following people that you don't want to know that stuff. So interesting for them to make a separate app for that. I think it, it's smart. And uh, I think this is geared toward a younger demographic who have fundamentally different ideas about what their privacy is or uh, expectations is or should be. They see far more of the upside of being able to let everybody know exactly what they are doing without them having to see it. Uh, if anything, I almost feel like we are going to see apps that trail more into this situation or into these kinds of, uh, of these, these kinds of asks uh, to turn stuff on. The only question is, where does the rubber meet the road in terms of how they do monetize it? Because they will eventually do it oh, yeah. not right now, but they will eventually. No, but because these are, these are going to have Instagram stories and the way Instagram stories is monetized is ads show up in between. And that that's going to happen. Uh, Tony, I'm curious if, you know, you see the, if you see any use or not for this in your life. Probably not in mine. Um, I, I didn't even know that Instagram had a, a close friends function. I mm -hmm. have the app. I post on it from time to time, but I'm a little older than their target market. So probably not for me. Well, I think that that that's part of we were talking before the show is like, OK, well, what's you know, is it weird? It's like, I don't know. These sorts of things don't it does. It's not so much that I'm like, oh, I you know, my privacy, it's going to be violated. It's more of just like I don't have any friends who care about these metrics. <laughs> And and I think that that you know that has a lot to do with the fact that you know I I I watched uh, you know my my twenty closest friends on Find My Friends and iOS just kind of drop off because we're just mm -hmm. sort of like we just don't really care that yeah. much. Um, it does come in handy sometimes, and I think yeah for for the younger set then this is you know some of these features are great, but you know I don't even like it when somebody responds to a text with like the like thumbs up emoji. What you don't like that? No. Cause I'm like, I got a notification, but you didn't say anything. No, but uh, it's so easy sometimes. <laughs> right. That is a dismissal. <laughs> no, it's ah, not. It's no, a no, it's, it's a baseline <laughs> communication. I no. love it so much. It's borderline passive aggressive. No! This is an etiquette question. No. That's, that's right. That's right. No. Tony's on my side. No, you're all wrong. <laughs>
Uh, well, Consumer Reports has issued a report called How Cable Companies Use Hidden Fees to Raise Prices and Disguise the True Cost of Service. I wonder what this report is about. Uh, <laughs> its analysis found that companies add, on average, $37.11 per month in company-imposed fees to the average bill. We're not talking about taxes. We're not talking about regulatory fees. Uh, we're talking about things that the company decided to add it as a fee on top of your stated base price. That ends up making the average that a U.S. consumer pays for their cable bill $217.42 a month. Now, some of that includes double and triple plays. Consumer Reports analyzed 787 bills from 12 companies, which included television in almost all of them. 426 of the bills included Internet as well, and 282 included phone. Company-imposed fees aren't required. They're just a way to separate the cost so that it looks different. Uh, examples include your broadcast TV fee or your regional sports fee or your HD technology fee, your convenience fee. Uh, it may also include your rental charges like your set-top box or your modem. Uh, for instance, Frontier charges you a $10 router rental fee whether you provide your own router or not. They still charge you the fee. Consumer Reports recommends cord cutting in their report because they say over-the-top providers like PlayStation View, YouTube TV, Sling TV, don't charge hidden fees. You know how much you're going to pay, and you pay that. However, they do note that if you do cut the cord for television, you're going to still need internet, and these cable companies are moving some of these fees into internet access bills as well. So you may not be able to escape them. Uh, I, I, I'm so glad that this article is here. Because I feel that we are into an era where whiners on the internet want to uh, uh, question the revolution that we have undoubtedly gone through in terms of over-the-top services. There was a viral tweet that happened a few weeks ago adding up all the subscription services and uh, uh, noting that indeed if you bought all these things that it would come out to gasp over $100. Yes, and it should because you get so much for that $110 compared to what you would get with cable. That would have been a $200 cable bill, and that's before you get to these fees. This is an industry that's been coddled and has been soaking us for so long that I am glad it, it now at least has a viable challenger. And we can point out the fact that they are squeezing harder and harder to make sure that uh, uh, money falls out of us consumers. Well, and Tony, I know you were you were stating that uh, this this is particularly of interest to you because you you don't have the kind of internet where you live that can handle streaming, right? Yeah, I, I can stream a little, but if someone is on Facebook on their phone in my house, Netflix is at a full stop. So I can't I can't cut the cord. I would love to. I want to. We've had the conversation in our family, but we just can't do it because. We want to be able to access stuff when we want to watch stuff, and we just can't always rely on that. And that's just because you don't have the providers other than wireless at this point, right? Uh, I have I have DSL, mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's slow. Yeah, uh, you probably max out at 1.5 megabits per second max, right? But this, I mean, Tony, Tony's a great example of you know I, I know a lot of uh, listeners of the show uh, are nodding their heads like, yeah, I mean it. If you don't have a situation where where you you have a lot of these options and it actually is something that you can live with, then you got to make do with the old with the old guard. Yeah, and uh, if cable internet is an option for you, well, well watch out. They're going to start packing these fees into your internet bill as well. So, but, but there there are differences in in those industries. There are there are yeah. more internet competitors than there were cable competitors, uh, uh, specifically in terms of the region. Uh, Monopolies. Yeah, and and the promise of five G is they'll be able to roll out to a wider area. So who knows? Maybe five five G service will solve it for you, Tony. We'll see. We'll keep That's our hope. fingers crossed. <laughs> uh, to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to DailyTechHeadlines.com. As we mentioned, uh, Tony just got back from the Finnovate uh, conference. Uh, explain real quickly what the Finnovate conference is for us. Yeah, it's it's a fintech conference series. They have different locations uh, all over the world. They have uh, San Francisco, New York, Dubai, Berlin, and Singapore. Um, so it's it's a little different from what you might expect. It's different from say a Money Twenty Twenty conference in that it's really short, quick hit demos. Uh, a lot of startups, uh, some more established companies come, but they have seven minutes to demo. And if they go over that seven minutes, a gong goes off and they 
just short of get yanked off the stage. Uh -huh. uh, their their mics do get cut. They get shamed off the stage. At times. Yeah. yeah. So it, it's a good uh, good place, in my opinion. Uh, part of my job at my bank that I work for is to look for new stuff, new products and services. So it's a good place to look and see what the trends are, uh, so that we can be relevant and stay relevant. Well, I, I figure AI uh, is is probably one of the top trends you saw. What did you see in AI there? Yeah, uh, so AI was one of the top things that I saw. A lot of buzz around uh, not just the demos, although there were uh, AI demos, but a lot of buzz, a lot of conversation around AI. And just the, the way they're using it, different ways that they're using that AI, you know, they can... One of the companies was really interesting uh, because when you call a bank, uh, if you guys are banked, uh, you often have to answer numerous questions to authenticate yourself. Well, one of these companies is using AI to authenticate the customer without even asking them any questions. It's using their voice recognition. So it's a biometric oh. and AI mixture so that we don't have to ask what your maiden's name, mother's maiden name, because everyone knows that the grandma on Facebook's got her maiden name showing. So it's right. really easy to get that information. Uh, so that's one of the ways they were doing it. Uh, Chatbots with AI uh, in a very conversational tone uh, was was another method. And then, of course, where the where the banks are really interested is using AI to dictate or to determine what the next action of the consumer is going to be. So we can look at the data that we've had for years uh, and we haven't been utilizing appropriately, especially on the community banking level. We can use these programs to determine, well, this person is about to leave. They're, they're about to cut their ties with us and we can be proactive about that and keep their business. Because you have a better idea of what the reasons might be, and and then you can preventively, proactively suggest things. Is that how that works? Uh, that that's my understanding. We can uh, predict from mm -hmm. their actions, you know, from the payments, from the from the things that they're doing. We can predict their next moves in in certain circumstances. What's how do you feel about the reliability of something like using AI for for voice recognition uh, to authenticate someone? Does that that feel strong enough? So, a uh, little background, I've been at in banking for 16 years, so I'm a little old school on mm -hmm. that, uh, that side. Uh, I like the idea, and if it can be proven to, be, to work, I'm all for it. However, I know my risk department, they don't like the idea. Sure. Uh, now, now, my bank has moved away from things that are easily obtainable, like mother's maiden name, date of birth, and things like that, to security codes. However, the issue with that is, when we ask what's your security code six times out of 10, they have no idea what we're talking about, even mm -hmm. though they've set that security code with us. So that it can be problematic as well. From a customer perspective, I love it because they don't have to go through the, the annoyance that they feel when they have to authenticate themselves. And I like to think that these community banks have gotten to the point where they're not asking people to authenticate themselves multiple times, but it does happen. So that could address that issue as well. And uh, speaking of community banking, I know one of the other trends uh, you said you saw were around open banking. Yeah. So one of the things that I, I feel, especially as a community banker, that we're going to have to really embrace to stay relevant is the idea of open banking, which uh, Europe has kind of paved the way for that. They, they've got these rules in place. And what that is uh, for those that may not know, is the the ability for these banks and financial institutions to have open APIs so that third parties can interact with their data. But uh, the European model, the consumer has control of that. They have control mm. of who is accessing that, which third parties are accessing the data. In fact, with registered third parties, if a consumer goes to a bank, they can require that that bank open that data to those registered third parties. Um, but with us, I feel that in order for us to, and I hate to be cliched about the younger people, but it is an issue for us to remain relevant as a community bank, rather than the, the big tech and the big social media of the world, we're going to have to open ourselves up to partnerships with people that can do the cool things that those other people can do. Oh, and and just the idea that that there's some pressure in in the fintech circles on on giving the customer control of their data is heartening to me. Yeah, and it it is it's important that the customer we want the customer to be in control of themselves, their data and their information, their finances. 
Uh, and one of the ways that this open banking movement can help the customer is put them in greater control of their finances. Most banks uh, have programs in place to teach the customer how to be financially stable, uh, financial literacy programs. We have an employee on staff, but that's all they do at my bank is, is uh, conduct these financial literacy programs. However, in the past, they've been geared towards the, the schools, teaching these kids how to fill out a check, which who cares anymore how to fill out a check, things like that. Um, but with these open, open banking products, we can give that customer more control and enable them to be more financially sound as well. Well, and that uh, sounded like that was another trend uh, that you saw was financial well-being. Yeah, it was. And one of the things that I noticed about it, because as I just said, in the past, we have focused on millennials and, and the younger generation. And that's still a thing. We do need to do that. I definitely saw a trend moving towards focusing on the aging um, because not only is that where the money is, and that, that's a fact, um, but they're also becoming more tech savvy. Um, you know, these people are becoming more involved with Facebook and Instagram. So they're getting used to these products. So we need to have products that enable them as well, especially things like retirement planning and things of that nature. Uh, we, we could talk forever uh, about this stuff. There's, there's so many good trends coming out there. I know you, I know there was a lot of talk about real-time payments as well. Um, so uh, thank you so much, Tony, for, for chatting with us about this. I appreciate give, you giving us these insights. Nah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Also, thanks to everybody who participates in our subreddit. You can submit stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. We're also on Facebook. Join our group if you haven't already. Facebook.com slash groups slash dailytechnewsshow. Hey, Sarah, did we get any mail? Oh, that's funny you ask. We did. Uh, this one comes from Mark uh, and it says, as a quick addendum to your chat on Google updating to DNS over HTTPS, a.k.a. DOH, you mentioned that Mozilla didn't get much heat for doing the same thing. Over here, that's in the UK, the ISP, uh, ISPA, which is the ISP Association, nominated Mozilla for their Internet Villain for 2019. Other candidates for the covered award are U.S. President Donald Trump, for causing uh, some uncertainty around a variety of things, and the EU's Article 13 Copyright Directive for Threatening Freedom of Expression Online by Requiring Content Recognition Technologies Across Platforms. Just airing a piece for from across the pond. So I think Mark's point is it, it definitely runs the gamut on, on villainy. Yeah, I, I saw that uh, story come across back in July, uh, and I actually emailed Mark about this. Uh, and, and yeah, it was... Not shocking that the ISP Association wouldn't like this because it does uh, because this protocol, as we mentioned in the story earlier this week, gets in the way of of domain name monetization uh, efforts. But even then, even with the ISPA getting angry at Mozilla, not it no didn't seem like a bunch of people jumped on that bandwagon to say, yeah, Mozilla's a villain. Right. Uh, whereas the Congress of the United States, uh, sending a letter to Google, uh, that that has a whole different tone to it. Uh, but but well well put, Mark. There there at least was one sector uh, getting angry at Mozilla, which is good to know. <laughs> uh, well, shout out to our patrons at the master and grand master levels. These are new Patreon levels, uh, including Chris Allen, Brad, and Tim Deputy. We'll be giving shout outs to all the folks in those levels as time goes on. So thank you for supporting us. Absolutely. Also, thanks to Tony Staley. It was such a joy to have you on the show today, uh, providing us some knowledge. Let folks know where they can keep up with the rest of your work. Uh, they can find me on Twitter at Tony Staley. I tweet about uh, fintech, basketball, and politics for the most part. <laughs> <laughs> you have a lot in common with the rest of us then. Yeah, right. <laughs> also, thanks to Justin Robert Young for being with us today. Justin, what's been going on since we saw you last? Uh, well, you know, obviously there is a lot going on in the world of politics. So if you would like to get on my free political newsletter, you can uh, go ahead and check out freepoliticalnewsletter.com. And, uh, of course, my po podcast, Politics, 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 which now includes a regular <laughs> segment uh, where I just read Tom's text uh, that he sends to me about Brexit. Yeah, text it about Brexit. Yeah. 
Uh, no, it's true. I, 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 I with, with, I can, I now know that uh, I will be, I will be texting about Brexit once a week, uh, and it will be read on politics, <laughs> politics, politics, and it's pretty awesome. So, go check it out, folks. Uh, we also have new Patreon rewards. Uh, become a member of DTNS and get a peek at our show rundown as we develop it, behind the scenes chats and more. And on November 1st, everybody who is at the $2 level or above will get a PDF copy of the official DTNS Good Day Internet Cookbook with recipes from the show hosts and even some listeners. So sign up now at patreon.com slash DTNS. If you've got feedback for us, we'd love to hear it. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We're also live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern. That's 2030 UTC, and you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Shannon Morse and Len Peralta illustrating the show. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>